So are weight loss injections like terzepatide, semaglutide safe? That's what we're going to be covering on the podcast today. This is a question I hear with so many patients. I've had this conversation even this week with patients. You hear lots of stuff on the internet, but let's talk about today. What does that data actually show? What does the science actually show? Is there an actual risk of these, you know, certain certain things? And what is that risk? Does the risk outweigh the benefit? Welcome to She's Healthy, a podcast for ambitious women on their journey to become the healthiest version of themselves. I'm your host, Lori Aikman. All right, if you guys have been following along on the podcast, this podcast is overdue. Um, So if you are new to the podcast, my name is Lori Aikman. I am a nurse practitioner in the state of Florida. I have a telemedicine practice and I will be honest, we have, it's been great. We've just been in, um, you know, really launching the practice, onboarding patients and getting going and it slowed down my podcast recording. So I apologize if you've been waiting for this episode to come out, but we're going to go ahead and dive right in. I will, first I want to say, so the, if you're paying attention, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm assuming you have an interest in, you know, you are, have an interest in these medications yourself, maybe to help lose weight. Maybe you have a family member or friend who's on these medications and you're concerned, you know, are, are they taking something they shouldn't, you know, but this is the biggest question I hear from people. I actually even did just did a poll on my social media, on my Instagram, like, you know, what is your, and safety across the board is the biggest concern because I want to say, I don't mean this in, like I just, right. The news is going to like publish the bad stuff. Like we hear a lot about the bad stuff. Like, oh my gosh, I know this one person who had this horrible experience and no one should take it at all. Right. But my, my thought as a clinician, you know, and somebody who prescribes these medications is we have to know what the research says. What does the data actually say? And let's make an informed decision, not, oh, I heard from so-and-so or, oh, I read on the news. You know, let's be honest, the news is going to be clickbaity. Like I get emails. I see the same like posts that you guys do a lot of times of, oh, you know, people taking weight loss injections have this problem, you know, and it's, it's so you go, oh my gosh, let me read the article. Right. But let's, again, let's look at what the data shows. Let's look at what the science actually shows that we we can make an informed decision. So the first thing, so are weight loss injections safe? I'm talking specifically about semaglutide and terzepatide. So semaglutide, these are our two drugs. If you look at the brand uh, name, these are uh, Wagovi and Zetbound. They're both from Eli Lilly, and they are FDA approved for weight loss for the treatment of obesity. So these medications started as diabetes medications. I talk about that in another episode. So, you know, they've actually been around. You know, some people think, oh, these drugs are really new. They've actually been around for almost 20 years now, this particular drug class, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And so the great thing is that we do have actually a lot of data about this drug class. So I'm going to talk about um, a couple of different things. We're going to talk about low risk of low blood sugar. We're going to talk about digestive issues, which I think is probably the side effect that you've heard most about. We're going to talk about um, gallstones or gallbladder issues, pancreatitis, um, the thyroid cancer risk. I know that is a huge concern uh, for a lot of the people that I talk to, Um, pancreatic cancer risk. And then I saw a random article about um, increase in suicidal ideation. So I'm going to address that too. So if you have a particular one you want to listen to, you know, maybe you can skip ahead or, you know, it's coming. Okay. So the first thing is looking at, okay, is if this is a diabetes medication, so a patient said that to me, I don't want to take it. I'm not diabetic. Like I shouldn't be taking a diabetes medication to lose weight. Right. Well, these medications are FDA approved for weight loss in people who don't have diabetes too. So the FDA, I'm just like, the FDA wouldn't approve it if it was not safe for you to take, right? If you're not diabetic. 
But um, so GLP-1, just a little review and you can go back to the other podcast, but GLP-1 is a, one of two incretin hormones. So these are hormones that are produced in the gut when we eat food, okay? So they discovered these hormones because they found that uh, when we inject people with blood with sugar in their bloodstream, there's a different insulin response than when people eat sugar, you know, or eat carbohydrates when they have those in their digestive system. So the GLP-1 then when that is stimulated, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, when they st stimulate GLP-1, this is a glucose. So basically you, you have to have sugar in, in the stomach for these things to be released. So basically just how the drugs work, um, they're not gonna, it's not like you're giving yourself insulin and it's going to cause your blood sugar to drop because you have it, 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 the, it, the response is, okay, you have, sugar in your bloodstream, you have, you know, you have carbohydrates in your gut, things like that. Then this, this hormone causes this initially increase in insulin. And then we see over time decrease in insulin and blood sugar levels, which is why they're used in diabetics. But just if you want to, if you don't understand all of what I said, just take my word for it. So these, these medications aren't just dropping your blood pressure or dropping your blood sugar. It's you, you've got to have, it's helping your insulin to work when you have an increase in blood sugar, um, in your system. Right. And so they actually looked at the data too. So, um, again, this is Ryu. I talked about this in another podcast, but there's a series of trials, uh, the step trials looked at specifically at semaglutide and then the sustained trials are now looking at terzepatide. But what they did is they looked at low blood sugar, you know, in, in patients that got semaglutide versus placebo and they're across the board. I'm not going to go through every single, um, study. I will actually, if you want to look in the show notes, or maybe if you want to look at the blog post on my website, I'll link the studies that I looked at and you can look at the data yourself, but there is not an increase in hypoglycemia or low blood sugar with the use of these medications. So that's, you know, first one. Then number two, so digestive issues. So again, this is the one you hear about the most. This is the one I hear most about from patients. And so digestive issues, the main ones being nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation, okay? So these are the what we're hearing about. And, you, and what we have to think of is the mechanism of action. So how these drugs work is they, they have a couple different effects, but one of the effects of why they help with appetite and weight loss is they slow down your digestion. So they delay gastric emptying. So it means, right, you eat food, it sits in your stomach, you have stomach acid and you have some, some enzymes in there that start to break down your food. And then, right, your, your food is going to move from your stomach down into your small intestine. Well, that process is slowed down. So if you've ever ate like a huge meal, especially a very fatty meal, right, it sits on your stomach for longer. So you might feel like nauseous, bloating, things like that, because that food is not processing, it's sitting there and staying on your stomach for a longer period of time. So just by how the drug works, this is, this is a potential side effect, right? And it is a very, you know, we're seeing that with patients. Um, and, and of course it's the nature of how the drug works. And just anecdotally, this is the most common side effect that I hear from patients. I actually talked to a patient uh, this week or last week who told me she had been on terzepatide and she actually ended up in the hospital because of, you know, gastrointestinal um, problems. So but what, what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you, okay, so we know that risk is there, but what is the actual risk? Um, and I'm going to give you like my two cents on maybe who are the the right people to take this and who are maybe people who should think twice or just really consider their options before taking these medications. So, um, this was, so what I did was I looked at a lot of the systematic reviews. So 
just to explain the research side of things. So we have all these trials that have looked at the safety and efficacy. So how well these drugs work and are they safe? And, and then people have gone in and made, done what they call systematic reviews or meta-analysis. So basically a research, so they're, they're not actually doing another trial. They're looking at all the trials and saying, okay, what does all this data show us about these drugs? Are they safe? Are they effective? Et cetera. So this is a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at um, safety and efficacy of semaglutide in patients uh, for weight loss, you know, patients that don't have diabetes. And this review showed that the risk of developing, when they looked at all these studies, and I'm sorry, I didn't write down how many studies they looked at. Um, but the, the review showed that the risk of developing these GI side effects, again, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, was a 1.5 times more likely with semaglutide treatment. So there is an increased risk. It's not huge. It's not, and, and I even see this in practice, not every single patient that's on semaglutide gets gastrointestinal side effects, you know. But there, we do see there is a slight increase in these gastrointestinal side effects when you're using this drug. And again, if we look at the mechanism of action, it makes sense that that might happen. But I will tell you that what they see looking at all these studies was that the way they say it, the, the a length of time that, that those side effects are happening are typically short. I won't, I won't say they're always short, but typically the side effects last for a little while. Um, and it's, and it did was resolve without stopping the medication. So, and, and what I see in practice is if we hold the dose, somebody starts to get nauseous or something like that, we don't increase their dose. We hold, if the side effects are tolerable and what I've heard again, most in clinical practice with patients that I'm working with is I'm starting to get a little nausea. I feel a little, you know, it's nothing serious, but I'm noticing it, right? Then we go, okay, let's hold your dose. Let's not increase. And again, anecdotally, what I've seen is, is when people are experiencing these side effects, it's where is when the dose is being increased. And sometimes the dose is being increased faster or more, you know, frequently than it should, um, maybe for that person. Some people can, can tolerate increasing the dose every two weeks. Some people can only in, tolerate it increasing every four weeks. Some people need less frequently than that. Um, but again, these side effects are not lasting. And a lot of times they resolve just with, you know, continuing as is doing things to help improve digestion, things like that. Um, you know, without having to discontinue the meds. So, so people out there saying, oh, these meds are horrible. Everybody's getting all these gastrointestinal side effects. So many people are discontinuing it. I even saw, just going to say, so I, if you guys have been following along for a while, I'm very passionate about functional medicine. I choose to, I consider myself like a moderate. I'm a blend of conventional and functional medicine. And there was a well-respected uh, or just well-known functional medicine doctor <laughs> on a podcast and just his take was like, these drugs are awful. They're causing all these terror, you know, and I just was going, is that really true though? Is that what the data says? And I think when you have a huge influence, like that we are a very influential person and you're making these huge statements, like you can really affect, you know, whether somebody get, you know, maybe this could help somebody and they're not going to try it because you're going, oh, these drugs are awful, blah, blah, blah. But what is, again, what does the data show? What does the evidence actually show that the risks are? And then you and your, you know, your practitioner, your provider can make an educated decision. Okay. So the other thing I want to say before I move on from digestive issues is, and I need to look at how, what time I have here. I try to keep these podcasts nice and, um, short for you. But the, so the patient I talked to last week, for example, she has a history of constipation, right? I, I think if, if you are considering going on this medication and you have digestive issues already, 
like let's from again practicing as more of a functional you know from a functional perspective i would say let's optimize your gut health let's see what's going on and how we can prove thing improve things and then maybe consider doing this drug if you're already constipated if you already have some of these issues we're going to talk about you've had gallstones things like that let's not put you on this medication without you know seeing what's going on and like making some steps here. So, so that's something I do in all of my patients is taking a look at their history, taking a look, what does their digestion look like now before we put them on a drug that's potentially going to worsen those symptoms. That's just my two cents. So, okay, moving along. The other risk is gallstone. So if you don't know, so right, your gallbladder, you can get gallbladder attacks. It's typically a right upper quadrant pain. Um, you know, your gallbladder is kind of in your liver. And so it's pain in that area. Um, and, and what you have to know is weight loss alone is, is known to increase the risk of gallstones. So you have this, you have bile that comes onto your gallbladder. And what happens is that it slows down. A lot of times they'll say there's sludge. So it's not as liquidy. It starts getting more viscous and it, it, it can create stones can be created that then block that bile duct. And then you get, you can get inflammation and infection and worst case scenario would be rupture of the gallbladder. Okay. So, so weight loss alone, just being on a diet can increase your risk of, of gallbladder disease, of, you know, gallstones. Um, so I, it, it's a, pre, so looking at a, a study here, looking, you know, um, at comparing, but just diet alone. So you, the prevalence reaches, I'm sorry, I'm just reading my notes here, 10 to, tw uh, 10 to 12%, uh, increase in risk after eight, to 16 weeks of a low calorie diet. So already just, just going on a diet, you're going to increase your risk by 10 to 12%. Okay. Just by going on a diet alone. So, but then, okay, do, do the drugs then do GLP one receptor agonists increase that risk even more. And what we see in the data. So this is again, looking at this, the step uh, trials, which looked at semaglutide, um, showed that yes, there is an increase in gallbladder dis, um, disease, you know, gallbladder disorders with the use of this, of semaglutide. Um, what they looked at was, so it's, it was, so comparing semaglutide with the control. So sometimes this is placebo. Sometimes this is with another diabetes medication. So the risk is, 2.6, looking at these different studies and different dosages, 2.6, 4.9, and 2.6 compared to 1.2, 1.5, and 1.3. So there is an increased risk, but it's 1% more, 1.5% more. I think the highest was that 4.9% um, in, you know, higher proportion of, and that's higher proportion of the participants. So more participants having gallbladder issues you know, that were on semaglutide. But I think, again, looking at your digestion, have you had gallbladder disorder already? What Let's look at, too, just your, um, so there's things that you can do to increase your, your gallbladder output. So there, what happens is the effect is on a hormone called cholecystokinin, and that's a hormone that causes the gallbladder to release bile. And there's there's things that you can do just slowing down your eating and chewing your food well that can help to increase the release of cholecystokinin and preventing, you know, gallbladder issues. So again, my thought is let's look at, let's look at this from, you know, a functional lens, a holistic lens, whatever you want to call it and see, okay, what, what's their history? Is there already a risk there? Are there things that we can do to mitigate that risk before putting somebody and then looking at overall, okay, what's that risk, you know, of, again, we said just diet alone increases by 10 to 12% versus what they saw in these trials were, you know, one and a half percent more people had gallbladder issues versus the placebo. So yes, there's an increased risk, but there's an increased risk with just dieting alone too. 
Okay, I want to keep moving. I'm trying not to get into all the nitty gritty here, but um, basically, so the next risk then we have is pancreatitis. And what we have to realize is that gallbladder disease and pancreatitis are related. So your gallbladder, uh, you know, is like this little balloon type thing. And then there's the bile duct where the gallbladder, uh, the bile gets released and then it goes into the small intestine. I wish I should get like a... a visual for you guys. But what happens is that so you have that gallbladder, you have the bile duct, and then the pancreas sits right there and the pancreatic duct empties into the gallbladder and then into, and the, I'm sorry, doesn't empty into the gallbladder. It empties into the bile duct and then the bile duct then goes into the small intestine. So gallstones themselves can cause pancreatitis because what happens is that stone blocks the bile duct. And then, so the pancreas is here trying to put out pancreatic enzymes and pancreatic juices, and it can't because there's a gallstone in the way blocking that bile duct. Okay. So if you have an increased risk in gallstones, again, that can increase with just dieting, right? You have an increased risk of pancreatitis, but what the, there's not a ton of the studies that looked at this, but some of the studies, systematic review and meta-analysis again, looked at terzepatide, um, and showed that it doesn't increase the risk for pancreatitis, but that it could again, increase the risk for gallstones. I just thought it was interesting that even though it increases gallstones, it doesn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily increase the number of pancreatitis cases, even though gallstones can cause pancreatitis. So again, there, there is a risk there. Is it huge? No, but it is something to be aware of and know, you know, signs and symptoms and what, and what to look for, things like that. Okay. Then the other big one is medullary thyroid cancer and the multiple endocrine neoplasia or MEN, you'll see this uh, um, abbreviated. So these are the black box warnings for these drugs. If you look, you know, I look on my, um, you know, my drug reference on my phone and the black box warning section for these drugs pops up and, you know, says, okay, these drugs have increased risk. And that's what I hear. The biggest concern is, you know, patients are like, I'm going to, am I going to develop thyroid cancer from this? And I think, again, I think some because of media, some because of, you know, we like to sensationalize things like, oh my God, all this stuff going on. Um, where these where these black box, black box warnings came from is, is a lot of these studies for the GLP-1s. And again, GLP-1s have been around for a long, long time. Succinda, Lyraglutide is, is, has been studied for years now, is that in rats, right? In rats, they, there is an increase in um, thyroid C cell tumors in rats, okay, including the medullary thyroid um, carcinoma and I mean, I believe so. So because of that, they don't, they really, there's no studies that have included people. So look, because of this FDA approval and then saying, hey, this is a black box warning. There haven't been any participants that we know of in the studies or that have a known uh, personal or first degree relative history of medullary thyroid cancer or multiple um, endocrine neoplasia. So these people... So people who would have an increased risk of these because they have fam personal history or family history haven't been studied because we saw, okay, these, these drugs increase this risk in rats. Okay. But then when they look at all these step one, two, three, four, five trials, there has been no reported, where is it? I just want to make sure I'm saying um, so overall, I should say overall, the prevalence of medullary thyroid cancer is very low, compromising only two to four percent of all thyroid cancers and no cases of medullary thyroid carcinoma were reported in the step one through step. So five trials, big trials looking at semaglutide safety and efficacy. There's been no 
cases of medullary thyroid carcinoma um, reported. So if you are a person who does not have any family history or personal history, there does not seem to be an increased risk for these types of cancers. If you are a person who has a personal history or family history of these cancers, we just are not, you know, they don't recommend that these people take these medications because there's this potential increase, but that's just been noted in rodents, not in humans. So again, I think this is a risk people hear about. You hear about the news or, you know, you read an article and you're going, oh my gosh, these, these drugs called cause thyroid cancer. Well, they have the potential to because they increase the risk in rats, but we actually haven't seen that in humans, but we also have it. This is like, I have to say I'm pregnant right now, right? There's not a lot of studies on safety of drugs or supplements in pregnant people because we're not going to go, well, let's see if this is safe for you and your baby. Let's, let's try it, right? It's same thing with, okay, you have an increased risk of these cancers. We're not going to, we're not going to try it out and see, well, let's see if it increases, you know, let's see if you get cancer when you take this drug, right? So I would say if you are a person with that thyroid cancer history of these particular types, which again, these are our even lower percentage of the types of thyroid cancer, um, you know, you may want to consider another option for weight loss. So, all right. I'm going to, I did have a couple more things I was going to cover, but I feel like I've already went over my time. I think, you know, my big two cents with all of these, um, looking at all this data is, is I think, again, you have to take the, take the information and make an informed decision, decide what, you know, based on your personal history, maybe what your digestion is like, do you have the thyroid cancer risk, you know, decide if you, and that's the only decision you can make, right? Is the risk worth the benefit? in taking these medications. Um, and, and we can see, yes, there are risks here, but they're not, obviously we wouldn't be using these drugs if these were huge. And what we look at overall is the, the risks associated with uh, being obese or having diabetes, right? Risk of heart attack, risk. Uh, I mean, there's just so, we know that being overweight, being obese, being morbidly obese, you know, decreases our lifespan. Like we have increased inflammation, we have poorer endocrine function, we have increased, you know, worse respiratory function, worse cardiovascular function. So it, it helping overall, we're seeing that helping people to lose weight improves their quality. It's not just losing weight, it's improving their quality of life improving their heart function. There's lots of studies on too. So these, these drugs with helping these people lose weight and the way that it's helping them lose weight is, is helping them live for a longer period of time, right? Decreasing their risk of all these other potential things that they can have with being obese, with being overweight, things like that. And so Okay, yes, there are these potential side effects, but the the actual data shows these risks are, I would say, small. That doesn't mean don't consider them at all, but they are small compared to the potential benefit that weight loss is going to be for you um, and how that could improve your life. So that's my two cents. Again, I would recommend working with an informed provider um, who can talk through these things with you and make sure that you're taking the right steps uh, and staying healthy on your journey so that you're losing weight in a healthy way, in a sustainable way. So all right, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, if you love this episode, please tag me on Instagram. Um, I'm at Lori Aikman, and I will see you in the next episode.